we have another Indian with us, seems to be enjoying life on the beach. You decide whether it's real or fake. Anyhow, uh, hello everyone. Today we have with us Shormi Shen. Uh, let's listen to her. Over to you, Shormi. Hi everyone, this is Shormi. I'm doing my PhD in economics from Monash at Clayton, based in Australia. So I joined here last sem uh, in February. This is only my second sem here. I'm quite a newbie in Australia. Uh, so yeah, that's about me, a pretty short introduction. Let's just go ahead. Okay, okay. So, okay, for starters, for my juniors who are planning to do their PhD, of course, if you are considering the states, which uh, most of you are, um, that's a bit of a different ball game. although the application process is the same. But if you are interested in coming to the, you know, the big eight in Australia, so I would say that give your GRE, prepare well, that is like uh, the cornerstone. And you have your TOEFL. Apart from that, what, what is different from your application package for the U.S. universities is this. In the U.S., you have to write an SOP. But here for Australia, and I think also for European universities, you have to write a proper research proposal. It shouldn't be an SOP. It's like around four to five pages long with the probable data sources, the proposed methodology. And, you know, if you could, uh, maybe you don't need to go into too many details, but if you could just specify that this is the econometric technique I want to use, if you want to work in empirics, if it's a theoretical work, accordingly, you have to model your uh, proposal. But the point being, the point of importance here is that it shouldn't be an SOP. You, you do not really have to say like, why am I motivated to do a PhD and all that sort of thing, which is, which in I personally feel it's a bit, you know, a bit wishy-washy. You can like make up stuff there. Here you cannot, it just has to be a solid research proposal. So work on that, uh, send it to your professors, get their feedback. And only after you are like, you know, you are convinced that you can defend your own proposal, only then do send it across. So how long did it take you to write your proposal? Uh, it took me around, uh, like coming up with the topic, reading up on that around the month. It took me around the month uh, to come up with the final proposal. Yeah. Okay, so but you were quite well familiar with the topic already because you can't write such a proposal in a month or can you? Yeah, no, actually the thing was uh, the topic on which I wrote my proposal, I had taken a course on that. Okay. So after completing the course, I uh, wrote that proposal. So yes, I mean, you, you have to like, I think for students in their final year of master's, I applied uh, when I was a lot older. I had done my master's quite a few years back. So for younger students in your final year, you should start working on the proposal uh, as soon as you finish your first semester, because it takes time. You have to like zero in on a topic and make it really workable. Like uh, the trick here is that the research question shouldn't be too broad, neither should it be too narrow. Yeah, but then of course, I mean, once you come here and you talk to your supervisor, your topic will change. It, it might change. I, I'm not saying that it will change, but in most cases I have seen that it does change, just being very frank here. So yeah, that is also, I think, one thing to keep in mind. We shouldn't like think that, okay, I gave in this proposal and this is what I will work on because it might not be that way. Um, okay. It depends on your supervisor and okay. whether you, you, you do get the data or not. So, yeah. Okay, but let's just go back a bit to how you decided to do economics and in the end, what were the pros and cons in your mind of getting to a PhD and you said you were a little older. So why don't we hear <clears throat> more from you on that and what led you to this path? Yeah, so in my class, uh, like in my higher secondary, I, I have taken up science with economics. Now I, I really enjoyed studying econ in school and my choices were very limited. I was like, either I'll study physics or economics. 
Yeah. So between those two, I chose econ because I simply found it a tad bit more interesting than uh, physics. And okay. I have to be like, uh, to tell you the truth, I also thought that physics would take would take a lot more study. And yeah. I was into a lot of co-curricular. So I chose it. Econ is the safer option. Wonderful. And also because, yeah, <laughs> it was true. And also like econ had a lot of uh, career opportunities. You can go into data analytics or join academia. But yes, I never wanted to go uh, for a corporate job. I always wanted to do research and, you know, to be a teacher. So this was the natural uh, course of uh, career for me. Mm -hmm. And I had done my MPhil. After that, I had joined a PhD program back in India at IIM Ahmedabad. But I had to withdraw from there because I had severe health issues and uh, yeah, then I was working for some time and after that, then COVID hit and all of that. So yeah. there was no question of uh, moving out of home at that point. Yeah. And when it's free, I shifted here. Okay. So, but what what was undergraduate life like? All these co-curricular things which prevented you from doing physics, a noble cause, and turned you to economics. Uh, what were those co-curricular activities? So I was uh, into painting, I, I was into elocution, drama, creative writing, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these things. Okay. So, yeah, and the university I attended, I went to Jadavpur. So Jadavpur, uh, they they do encourage you to, uh, you know, participate in, we have a lot of clubs and stuff on campus. So, yeah, undergrad life was very enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't bunk classes. Uh, there is this, you know, with recent news and all, I know uh, there is this misconception that uh, in JU, we don't do classes. I mean, at least I don't know how it is now. In my time, we did classes. Okay. Like, we never bumped. Never so, bumped. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, like, very few. Few yeah. and far between. Yeah, yeah. Did they take attendance? They did. They did, they did take attendance. We had to, like, uh, keep a minimum 75% uh, attendance. Yeah. So they took attendance in every subject, right? Every class, in, every day. Uh, in every uh, paper, yeah. each and every professor used to take attendance. Okay, wonderful. All right. So you went to class and yet you had enough time to do all these other things, right? Yeah, after class, I mean, yeah, weekends. So yeah, okay. I mean, you can manage. Yeah. Uh, for the younger students, yeah, if you really want to, you can manage. Yeah. I okay. mean, we are hard pressed for time during our PhDs. Yeah, uh, undergrad and masters was uh, good. Life was good back then. Okay, all right. So, uh, so was it natural to just go from your BA to an MA in economics, or what happened? Any decisions at that point? Uh, for me, no, because uh, like, uh, what were my options really? I could have gone for an MBA or a masters in economics. So no, since I wanted to stay on in academia, it was uh, like very the most obvious choice for me that okay was. so ma from where i did it from jadavpur oh from jadavpur so you just linear continuation yeah yeah, yeah. okay yes. and after jadavpur after jadavpur so yeah so i had a few health issues because of which uh, i at that point of time i was constrained to stay back at home uh, but yes uh, for my juniors i would definitely recommend without batting an eyelid that if you do your undergrad from Bengal, please, please do your, like, try to do your master's from the following, ISI Delhi, DSC, IGIDR, JNU, MSc, like, this is a sincere request to my juniors. Okay. Like, I, I had my constraints. I had yeah. really binding constraints, but if you don't have any such... Uh, you know, binding constraints holding you back. Please, please do try to get out of the state hmm. uh, if you want to have a good career. Yeah, Just... I heard from a young Bengali woman who went to her BA in Kolkata. And of course, she said, you know, comfortable life at home and it's home. And then to JNU for the master's and now staying in a hostel and staying with all people rest of kind of people from India and she said it really benefited me I grew up because 
I have to first of all share a room and you know things were not so cushy as at home <laughs> and you know the people from all over India different backgrounds and so on so it really she said very clearly that I grew up and realized what India is like what life is like at in Kolkata life was cushy too cushy in a way that you know you stay at home and everything's looked after you and she really said yeah it's a great idea so I think I've heard this before, that it's a great idea uh, to move to another town, to another set of people, and to get to know them too. So, I, you know, normally I don't comment on what the speakers say, but I've heard people say this. So, I think it just validates what you're saying. And then after your, uh, I, I assume you were uh, getting good marks all this time, right? You were academically oriented, so you were getting good marks. So then after the master's? After the master's, I did my MPhil. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't apply for a PhD because uh, there were some, the university didn't bring out the results. So without the final results, we couldn't apply for a PhD. Right. Uh, so everyone in our batch, those who wanted to stay on in academia, uh, we had to apply for the MPhil. Yeah. Because even with a provisional result, you could apply for an MPhil back Yeah. Then. I did my MPhil uh, from Jadavpur. Yeah. After that, I went to IIM Ahmedabad for my PhD. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But and how was I, how easy was it to get selected there? So IIM Ahmedabad, the thing was, uh, I gave CAT, so yeah. I had uh, I had decent marks in CAT. So I think you definitely to get into the PhD, you need uh, you need to have you need to score above the ninety fifth percentile. It's not as competitive as the MBA program, but even then for economics, you definitely need to have above 95 or 96 in, in CAT. Yeah. And apart from that, they have a written exam, which is mostly mathematics because mm. uh, many students from a non-econ background also apply for a PhD in econ. Yeah. So the test is only on math. And once you clear the exam, then combine like combining your CAT score and that exam score. Yeah. Uh, people are called for an interview. Okay. There's a there's a first round of interviews, uh, where professors will ask you about, uh, basic not basic I would say advanced macro micro and econometrics. Yeah. If you're from an economics background, I don't know how it was for engineers and uh, other students. Uh, they would ask you about what topic you would like to research in. Hmm. Oh, yes. For IIM, one more thing, you again have to submit a research proposal, yeah. not an essay. Yeah. Yeah. So you would get asked a few questions about your research proposal. Yeah. And uh, then once that interview is over, they again select a few and then there's a second round of interviews. And after that, they bring out the final list. Okay. And yeah. it's, in my but, batch, yeah. four people got selected. There okay. were around, there were many applicants. I believe. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. And then they pay you for it, right? They know you don't, it's free. PhD is free. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they, uh, no, you have to pay an admission fee. Yeah. Uh, part of it, I think, is refundable, like even if you withdraw or uh, like uh, when you get the degree at the time of your convocation. Okay. But yes, they do give a fairly uh, handsome stipend, which is comfortable. I mean, and they provide you accommodation on campus. Yeah. So everything is uh, pretty fine. Okay, fine. Anyway, how long could you stay there before your health issues? I, I stayed there for uh, around a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I, I think I had to leave just before I had completed my coursework. Okay. But but it, it was a fantastic place. It, like the coursework, mm -hmm. the way things were taught, mm -hmm. uh, the the sort of assignments we had to do. It was very different from what I had done during, like not, not just different in terms of content. That is obvious. Like you're doing a PhD, the content would be different. But the approach towards learning, it was so very different. And we had to do classes with the MBA students. We also had to tutor them at times. So 
it was a great learning experience. And like uh, like Saru said, the pre one of the previous speakers, uh, she had mentioned that yes, getting out of form is a big big experience in itself. And okay, all right. So after that, after that, yeah, after that, I came back home because of health issues, and I was working at Cuts International for some time. That's uh, an NGO. Yeah, yeah, it's a registered trust. And uh, so I was involved in the research uh, team uh, mm -hmm. for one of the uh, departments there. And then uh, in the meanwhile, I had applied here and I got through and then here I am. So you didn't let your health stop you from getting your PhD? No, because uh, no, I was like pretty determined at that point of time and I had also made up my mind because of a host of reasons that uh, I was not going to stay in India. Okay. Take a chance and see what it's like to, you know. No, what you. I'm saying is that PhD was ingrained in your thinking. Whatever yeah, happens, yeah. whatever I'll happens, do this. I'll do yeah. this, right? Okay, yeah. I couldn't do it there for health. I couldn't do this. I have to do this and all. But no matter what, I'm going to get that PhD. Well, yes, you know, yeah. So that's a great uh, story, and it's a story of you know determination and grit, because the health issues can be quite a thing. I mean, I'm not going to ask you what they were, but you know, they forced you to leave I am Ahmedabad, so they were obviously not minor, and you know, you had to stay on in Jadavpur, so obviously they were not minor. But whatever they were, uh, you overcame that and said, look. I am going to get my PhD. Well, that's determination. <laughs> Speaks for itself. All right. Wonderful. So how is it that you chose Monash? Or you just applied to all eight in Australia? No, no. I didn't apply to all eight. I had only applied to Monash. I didn't even apply to the US. Uh, so the way I went about it is, and, and this is very unusual. It, I mean, uh, for most people, it's not this way. So, because I had already lost a few years while being at IIM Ahmedabad, I wanted to wrap up my PhD quickly too. So, in Australia and Europe, you can do it in about four years. Whereas in the US, it will take you a minimum of uh, five and a half to six years. Right. So, I, I had ruled out the US. And then, of course, I looked at the university rankings. Like, say I want to do some PhD from one of the top 50. So here I had only applied to Monash. I hadn't applied elsewhere, no. So yes, the way you go about it is you, uh, once you have a research, a tentative research proposal in mind, you reach out to professors. And if any of the professors, I mean, you, ha you do have to mail more than one professor. Uh, but when they, if anyone shows an interest in taking you up as a PhD student, uh, so the process in Monash is a bit different. In order to apply, in order to lodge an expression of interest, they call it an EOI, an expression of interest. Uh, 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 sorry. So in order to lodge an application, you need to have an expression of interest. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's like saying one, uh, you need to have a professor in the department uh, of faculty here saying that, okay, I approve of this person applying here. Yeah. Understood. You have to go through that process yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, for Australia. I mean, in you for the U.S. universities, you can just apply. Right. You, you don't need to get this invitation to apply. No. But here okay. you need to get an invitation and then you apply. But then again, that in no way guarantees that you will get a spot. No. Because I've seen people getting the interest, but then not getting the admission. Right. right. Like, yeah, happens. Yeah. So, and also... One of the other major problems, I would say, uh, for all Australian schools, I think, is the scholarship. Like in the US, whenever you get a PhD, a scholarship comes with that. Yeah. Like, but here, a scholarship and a PhD offer are totally separate. Okay. It's like in Europe, like you have to apply for the scholarship separately. Okay. Either you have to have one from your home country, from the government, or elsewhere. Or like you have to apply for one here. So till now, there were no departmental scholarships here. Yeah. It was all central. So say uh, 10, 
10 faculties or seven or eight faculties uh, vying for uh, two scholarships. Yeah. So this process is very competitive. And uh, yeah, I just think that, you know, students, if they're thinking of applying to Australia, they should keep this in mind. Okay, wonderful. That's very helpful for future students. But let's hear more about you, not just about future students. What's going on? I think you had once said that you were very unhappy with the education system in West Bengal. If that's true, let's hear your views on that. Yeah, so I am. And I think many of my peers are. And we cannot really speak out uh, because, uh, you know, uh, that would, it, it's, it's a mess back there. Um, and how do I even put it? If you speak out very politely, I'm not saying that you uh, lash out in a in an aggressive manner. You you just put forth your points in a very polite, in a very logical way, and you would be banned from getting a job. That's hmm. that's how it is in this way. Banned I'm from so sorry to put it out there. Banned from getting a job in any oh, of I... the universities. In uh, any of the colleges, so uh, I would say it's it's not about merit. Yeah. In Bengal, getting getting because ultimately, what do we want? We want a faculty position, and we we want to get that honestly with honest work. Yeah. But you don't want to resort to other means to get yeah. that job. Yeah. So, and research, it's not happening. It's just okay. not happening. So I I think in the rest of India. The situation is a lot better, but Bengal, I mean, sir, if you interview other Bengali students, uh, many would tell you the same if given okay. an opportunity. We just can't speak up because we are too afraid. That's yeah, no, it's okay. Fine, I understand. I'm not forcing you, but you had mentioned it. So, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm very unhappy about it, and I really, really wish that, you know, something is done, and I have deliberated upon what that something can be. Uh, but honestly, I don't see any way out. Okay. I think the right. people in power need to like. Do all right, fine. I understand what you're saying. We don't want to go in that direction at all. Okay. Anything else you want to add at this point? Uh not really. Yeah. So, so uh, for for people from Bengal, I would say, yeah. Once you do your graduation for your masters, please get out of the state. Try to get into one of the good economic schools elsewhere in India. Yeah. If you want to go abroad, yes. And uh, yeah, get your fundamentals right. Work hard, the usual stuff. And yeah. there will be a lot of pitfalls along the way. And you just have to, you know, uh, keep your chin up and trudge along. Like, don't give up. Never give up. Come okay. what may. All right. But how is it in Australia for you? Oh, it's good. It's I, good. I, I really, I, I really like uh, huh. uh, the university. The professors are very supportive. Uh, I have a wonderful supervisor, and um, who really like wants me to put in my best efforts and do well. And uh, yeah, the infrastructure, uh, the kind of support you get from your senior uh, colleagues, uh, senior PhD students, uh, that is also great. And yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying life here. It's good. Life is good. So, but you don't feel underprepared with your courses. I mean, it's not like... Uh, yes. No, oh, yeah. So that uh, that was, of course, there. Like, uh, especially for econometrics, I feel like we had an econometrics course in the first semester here. And um, people, like, I was the only one who had done her master's from India. Yeah. All the other students here had either done it from Australia or from the US. Yeah. So they, I found, were familiar with uh, the, you know, the econometrics part. Uh, I was not. So, yeah, I think before you go to any uh, good school abroad, uh, brush up on your econometrics. Like theory, micro theory, micro theory, I would still say we have done it. At least in Jadavpur, I, I, like I can only speak for Jadavpur. Even advanced mic micro theory, you can catch up on. Okay. Because uh, that base is good, but macroeconomics and uh, econometrics, the Indian students really need to brush up on. 
But you could catch up. Too. But in the end, you could catch up. Right? It did in not. In the end, yes. You in didn't the end, it. yes. But I, yeah, but I had to like work really hard for that. Okay. Like, All right. You know, it takes a lot Fair of work. Enough. And here, okay. here they have assignments every week. Like we have to like submit two assignments yeah. every week. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you will be kept on your toes, and uh, you you cannot slack off during the semester. Right. Once it's over. Yeah, you have a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. How about do people have to so take some part time work or jobs or not needed? You have enough money. Uh, not really. So for those who do not get a scholarship, they have to uh, work definitely. They have to work as a tutor. Uh, PhD students work as tutors. So I also do some tutoring here. Uh, even though I do get a scholarship, I do some tutoring because. I mean, Melbourne is very expensive. So, yeah. And uh, also, uh, it's good to, you know, to teach because ultimately for those in academia, we would like to be a professor. That's the final goal. Uh, so, yes. Uh, I mean, people are divided on this, but uh, my supervisor also told me that it's good to teach. Uh, yeah. Like every semester, you should keep in touch with teaching. Yeah. Maybe okay. not too many classes, but some. Okay. So yes. People people usually work. Uh, but then again, there are many people who do not work. They think that the scholarship is enough. All know. right. One all right. It's a divided, it's personal and personal. really how motivated you are, what your background is, you have enough time to work and so on. So yeah, these are personal things. All right. Anything else you want to add, or shall we end it here today? Well, no, I I think that's uh, all. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, thank you, Shormi. Uh, I'll be back with another young person or an expert soon. And we'll I'll see you then. But for the moment, it's a bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. sir. Yeah. Thank you.